Hey yo, hey yo, it's your boy Monster Man Rocco. It's your boy Swagger Rock. This is Snack Ripper. And you have to go to don't know. Master Ace, you are not rocking with the best. Breaking Records Radio. Breaking Records, man, radio is like the place to be. I don't know, fuck strange music, man. <laughs> <laughs>now tuned in to Breaking Records Radio. My name is Alex and I got here with me one of the illest dudes to grace the mic in Canada, the East Coast Overdose, the Howtown legend. Speaking to the man himself, classified, what's good my man? What's happening? How you doing? Oh man, I'm doing great on my end here. Again, I said this at the beginning of the call, but I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak to me here today. I appreciate it and I'm looking forward to the talk. Oh good man, thank you. Yeah, I would, I would love to just again start with some of, I guess, your upbringing, your roots. So you come from Halifax, and I'm always just amazed, especially in the kind of the mid to the late '90s. Halifax at that period of time was was incredible, and I think a lot of people don't really recognize just how much kind of talented MCs came out of there, and producers and engineers in the whole nine yards. You had like Hip Club Groove in the early '90s, Drill Run, of course, Halltown Project, yourself, um, Sebi Tones, and everything Rich ended up doing in radio as well. Uh, crack beat society like all these little independent kind of movements that were happening um but you you started within that kind of moment that era um yeah i kind of started on the outside of that era though like i was coming from enfield you know which is like a half hour outside of halifax sure. and like those groups you said like hip club groove joe run I remember being in Enfield when I was like 14 or 15 and just reading about those guys in the paper and be like, oh shit, like there's rappers from this area that are in the paper and stuff. And that was kind of like my first, you know, introduction to that. And, you know, being from Enfield and just like me and my couple friends that rap, we were always trying to, you know, get involved with a bigger scene. So just seeing that and then trying to connect with Joe Run and Joe Run kind of introduced me to like the whole scene. And just even hip hop in general on a culture perspective, rather than just the music and, you know, being a small kid from a small town, not really understanding the culture. Joe Run taught me a lot of that. So. so were you going up to Halifax on a regular basis then? You said it was about 30 minutes away. Was that yeah, yeah. Regime? Yeah, like that was the only way we could record. Like originally, like Joe had a four track and a sampler and, you know, we just didn't have any of that. So. Like we used to hitchhike. I remember like leaving school early, hitchhiking into Halifax or taking my parents' car, but I had to have it back before they got home from work or they knew I would, I went to Halifax and, but yeah, that was, that was like the struggle in those days was just getting out of Enfield into Halifax to be involved in the scene and, you know, learning how to use a sampler, learning how to use a four track, which Joe sh showed me all that stuff. And then, you know, doing shows or clubs and stuff like that. It kind of evolved into that, just being on the scene and seeing these other artists and, seeing the way they moved and kind of learning from them. Yeah, it's crazy. I think looking back and with hindsight, you can kind of see the value of a scene um, with, again, 20 years distance. But at the period of time that you were kind of coming up and visiting Halifax and seeing what was going on at like Cafe Olay and different freestyles and how to yeah. up down compilations, all that kind of shit. Um, did you know that there was something special that was kind of curating in the city or... It was just realize. special to me coming from where I was from. I've never seen a DJ for turntables. Yeah. You know, just, I remember the first time we, we did the Helltown Project show. Weird, I'll never forget this date, but it was May 12, 1995. It was at Cafe LA. And I remember going to Soundcheck. Like, Joe Run just invited me and Matt. We were the Celtic Rebels. We were like, you know, a little rap group. And he's like, hey, if you guys want to jump on the show, it's like the whole Huddle Fax team doing the show. So we came down to Satchek, Joe Wolf and Enfield came in the afternoon and just seeing like Joe on the turntables, Nathan C, Skills, Flexman, all these guys just joking around on stage, spitting bars and, you know, jumping off the stage for break dance, and just joking around, having fun. Like that was really something that stuck in my mind of like, shit, like I've never been open. To, I've never seen any of this before. It was always on TV and stuff. So it was just eye-opening so for me it was just like holy shit like this is real now this this feels real whether or not the rest of the world was paying attention to it it was just like a personal thing for me to be able to see this stuff and get excited about it and that's just another thing that just sparked my interest and my excitement to to keep doing this music thing and, and getting involved in hip-hop yeah and they were super dope as well right like real talented mcs you mentioned nathan c which i guess at that nathan, time, nathan c was like nathan a nathan real MC. yeah Nathan, yeah, but he was Roughneck. His name was Roughneck when I first yeah, heard it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But like that's he right. used to rap, you know, kill, 
you know, just bars, groggy style. But then he'd break out in the middle of the show and do a fucking Michael Jackson dance routine. <laughs> and the crowd was going wild. Like, I just never seen this shit before. Even callbacks, like, yeah. if you feel a rough neck, there, hell yeah. And the whole place, hell yeah. I was like, oh my God, I've never seen this shit before. Like, you know what I mean? Nathan was like a real MC before. Well, I guess early 90s, being an MC, if you wanted to rap, you had to be an MC. It wasn't like you just rap and put your shit on the internet and you rap now. Like, you had to prove yourself in front of the crowd. So, those times were different. And, and me seeing that for the first time, it was just like, oh, shit. And, and like I said, I just learned so much from them guys, being around those guys, becoming in a group with Nathan C. Like, we started Ground Squad, me and him, a couple yeah. years after that. So, I got to produce a lot from him, learn from him, vice versa, and just, you know, having that circle of people that inspire you around you is very important. Yeah, the earliest kind of thing that I'm familiar with you from is, I guess, Ground Squad in some degree, just in terms of hearing the name mentioned here and there, um, but the Basements of Batman compilation that you were on, and, and you were on that song, what was it, uh, Shit Can Be Shit? Shit oh, Can Be Shit, what, what, a, what a song title. <laughs> <laughs> Every time someone says that, I'm like, what the fuck did I name it, Shit Can Be Shit? But I think it was something I said in the song, but yeah, like that was Thomas Quinlan, um, and Solo Records, yeah. And Solo Records, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, Thomas used to work for his claim, so I used to set up, send him on my cassettes. And, you know, these days, recording on four tracks, setting up cassettes for reviews in Exclaim Magazine. And then that's how I got to connect with Thomas. And he asked me if I wanted to put a song on this Basement to Bad Man thing, which Joe was producing a lot of it. Stinkin' Rich was, or Buck 65 was producing a lot on it. But it was just, like, really showcasing the East Coast scene and what's going on down here. And that was, like, 96. 97 maybe? I think it was earlier than Yeah, maybe 96. I was thinking like 95, 96. But yeah, it was it's really early. That was the earliest thing that I ever heard from you. And I think it was before you had some of those tapes out as well. Cause, and no, that of, was that was after my second tape. Because that, that shit tapes? that you did song was on my second tape. So I, I had like my first cassette that we pressed up 100 copies of. Time's Up Kid, it was called. Then I had the one shot album. And that's where we took the, the track of the basement to the band album. Okay. Um, speaking of the, the early kind of tape run that you had before Half-Life, you had the, the label and it was called Shit Records. Um, no, oh, oh Shit Records. Oh Shit Records, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what my, my infatuation with the word shit is now that <laughs> we're having this conversation. But yeah, I definitely use that word to describe a lot of things. So. But yeah, Oh Shit Records. And, and, and like at those times, you know, that's 15, 16, it was like, yeah. Oh, I'm going to press up cassettes. You go get them pressed. You, you make your album cover and just to make it look more legit. You needed to have a record label of some sort, just to make it, you know, for me anyway, I felt like it looked more legit, so it was just something we came up on the fly, made a little symbol and chucked it on the back. Was that the same sort of mentality when you started Half-Life? Like, obviously, Half-Life kind of developed into something a little bit more than that, but... Yeah, yeah, but no, same thing. It was like, you know, no one wanted to sign me. I was just a kid putting out his records and wanted to seem more legit, so I made up my little record label, and it kind of grew from there. We ended up, you know, my first deal with Sony, I did it through my own label, Half-Life, and then, then the, the label got registered and became an official business and all that. And to this day, like all my, every one of my albums, like I own it all and it's all on Half Life Records. So kind of started out as something just to make shit feel more legit. But as I kept growing, it became something more real. It's amazing. Uh, you mentioned Celtic Rebels kind of earlier on. And again, the, the earliest yeah. stuff that I'm kind of aware of you is, is later than that, anyhow. Um, can you kind of describe Celtic Rebels, who was in it, and how that ended up forming? Yeah, yeah. Well, like originally when I was like 14 or 15, I was in grade 10, and there was three other guys that rapped, but they were all in grade 12, like AJ White, Matt McDougal, and Scott Brown. And they had a group called The Call to Jim. I don't even know what the hell it was until years later. Jim was the, the weed dealer at Enfield, and that's what it was based on. But I didn't even know this when I was in the group. We did like, you know, school dances, variety shows, a couple things like that. Sure. And then me and Matt McDougal kind of went off on our own and just started our own thing. And we were big influenced by Cypress Hill, House of Pain, stuff like that. And Matt came up with the name Celtic Rebels. I think it's the line Everlast said in the song. It's like, you know, it's, he was big on his history and stuff. So I was like, yeah, cool. Like at those times, I was just a young kid. So I was rolling with whatever fucking everybody else said. I was like, cool. Sounds like a great rap name. I'll, I'll be in the group. Like I just wanted to make music and have fun that way. So that was just me and Matt. I think I was in grade 11. 12 the time we did that and that first show I was telling you about to Cafe LA in 95 that was me and Matt you know doing that show and that was kind of our, our first introduction to the real scene but yeah it was just a, a high school group name between between me and another guy 
did you end up ever doing any recording with that material or was it just like talent shows and whatnot? No, yeah, we did like four track shit at my house and, you know, my little studio or my little four track, but nothing that ever really came out. Could we ever see like early demo material put out on? Yeah, I I can't even look at that. It's weird because most of that stuff is like I found one of my old cassettes that ended up becoming Time's Up Kid, my first one, but it had like just early demos and stuff I was making online, but I I don't know if I ever put that stuff out now. The only other place you might see like, where his name was Jolly Green Giant Duck Boy. That was the other guy who got the trouble. Yeah. He rapped on my information album. Uh, I can't even remember what the song's called now, but it was me, him, and Casper. And it was like the last time I was able to convince him to come out to the studio and record with me. And, and then he moved to Australia, and I haven't barely talked with a guy in 20 years. So. Fair enough. Um, the Ground Squad. So one of the things, and again, I haven't heard material from Ground Squad. I'm not even sure if material was actually recorded for the group, uh, but I have heard the name in passing. And the, the roster has always kind of been interesting to me because to the best of my knowledge, there's a few different cats in there that were originally a part of another group called Mad Craze or Mad Kraz. Um, yeah. yeah. Can yeah. you detail that, I guess, transition? It, was it like a amalgamation of people that were already in Mad Craze and then kind of... Well, yeah, like the whole group. Like it started with me and Nathan C. I was producing some stuff for him and we like started working with the, this guy named White Mike and KL. They're two guys from Sackville. And we were like, hey, you know, let's try to do this all together. Kind of like a Wu-Tang thing. Take like who we thought were the best MCs in the city. Um, And, and we were kind of outskirts too because like at this time when you say like Buck 65, Sebitone, The Goods, those were like the hot guys City, which is more, I don't want to call it nerd rap, I don't know, abstract rap, whatever you want to yeah, call it's it. Yeah, it's a weird it experimental, a, it's an anticon Exactly. Show, right? yeah. It was a different scene than what we were, so we were always on the outskirts, so we were like, you know what, let's just focus on our own shit, not worry about being in that clique, and start our own thing. So me and Nathan got White Mike and, and Marvin, then we got Mad Craze, which was Knucklehead, Short Chain, Unknown, and Big Fault, well, Big Fault wasn't right. but like those three guys, so it was like seven or eight of us. And, you know, we just started hanging out, doing a lot of shows. And we did make an album. We put an album out and everything. And, like, at one point, like, you know, we felt like we took over the city. We were on the front of the newspapers. And, you know, just a lot of talk about this group, mainly probably because we were, like, eight guys. And, you know, in Nova Scotia, Halifax, you just don't hear that, hear about that happening very much. So, you know, we had a good run for, like, a year or two. And then came down to, like, it always comes down to. I felt like I was working harder than everybody else. And it just became frustrating to you know, be the producer of the group, recording the group. I think the last show I did with them, <coughs> I showed up at the show and the DJ didn't have headphones and I had to go home and get my headphones and I was, fuck, I was pissed. Yeah. I was just like, fuck this shit. I do everything in this shit. And, you know, that was it. I was, you know, I still get along with those guys. I still did some music with them, but it just became me more focused on classified. And, you know, I think my album, act, it went from the Grand Squad album and then I did Unpredictable and kind of just went on my own from there. Fair enough. Over the years, you haven't really returned to, to do real group work. I think Half-Life as a record label is probably the most kind of collaborative space that you're, you're involved in. Um, do you ever yeah, yeah. You definitely, definitely, some... definitely collaborate with other people, though. Like, I, yeah. White, White Mike, you know, for a good five, six, seven, maybe ten years after that, he would still do, like, White Mike shows up on a couple of my albums, even one of my recent ones. You know, well, not too recent, but like self-explanatory that came out in 2009. He was a big part of the Choose Your Own Adventure stuff. Um, and Grind Squad, I did put on, uh, what was the two songs we had? You, you can't, it's pretty obvious and, uh, no breaks, which were off my like union dues around my 2001, 2002 album. So they did pop up here and there. And, and Knucklehead, who was on Super Nova Scotia on my last album. So he was yeah, really good. I seen that. So, that was amazing to see. Yeah, yeah. So we, I still got those connections. See those guys here and there, but they just don't do the music as much. So unless something makes sense, it's not like, hey, let's just hang out, and make some music for fun, like the old days. It's amazing, man. I, I could talk about this history all day long. This is like that era of Halifax rap. I think is some of the best shit, definitely to come out of Canada. Um, but just it was just some such a hip hop period. Yeah, yeah, and it was just it was competitive, but like friendly. Like everybody did shows together. Like there was one rap show. Pretty much every rapper in the city was there because it just didn't happen a lot. And it was just a really tight connection. And, and like I said, this was before internet time. So to do this shit, you had to do shows. You had to be out at the Kyber or Cap Pele or the Pavilion or the Marquee or Bird, Birdland, is that what it's called? 
pretty cool, man. But like these bars downtown that like, you know, they had hip hop nights and stuff and it was just a tighter scene and just yeah, it was an exciting time. It seemed like a lot of stuff was going on. Yeah, there really was. Like in hindsight, I think that was a really rich era of Halifax rap history. And as you ended up getting into the early 2000s, you, you get stuff like Backburner and a lot of new, uh, like Alpha Flight and whatnot that start kind of making, yep. making moves. But it doesn't feel like it has the same sort of kind of gravity as, as it did in the late 90s. No, no, I feel you. I feel you 100%. Yeah, it, and that doesn't take anything away from people like Backburner and, and Alpha Flight. Like, I love that type of music. It's it's great. Um, I love Jesse Daniels. Oh, but I think Backburner and Alpha good. Flight was more like, it was an excitement in Halifax, especially the people involved. But like, when the Sebutone and shit like that, like that, yeah. that, that was outside of Halifax. Like, people were paying attention to that shit, you know, wherever, all over the world. And it was, <laughs> you know, it, it was different. It was an exciting thing. And, yeah, no, I, I, I feel you that. It was a cool time, especially for me, because I was so young at this time. So for me, I was, you know, no kids. I think I had a girlfriend at the time, but I didn't, I didn't pay enough attention to her. But it was just running around the city and just, you know, oh, so-and-so wants to record. Cool, come over. Or I'm going to go to Joe's house. He's recording here. Or, you know, it was just it, it was just fun to be around. Every day was something new and exciting. And I, and to me, that's the, that's the journey of it. Like, that's the fun part of doing music that I always tell people now is like enjoy that come up when you're coming up because you know once you get to that point where you feel like you made it the things that matter are those moments you had yet yeah I think a, a theme when I listen to some of the newer material that you have on the go is is just I guess how you approach music is is shifted is, is a bit different as of now right um, obviously you're growing up you're mature you have a family um, but in addition to that I feel like you're doing it a lot more not not to say you weren't doing it for fun, but you're doing it for, for fun and for your own entertainment without really any um, further incentives kind of pushing. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. no, 100%. Like, I've tried to retire a few times, but I just still have fun making music. So, yeah. you know, I'd say, you know, five, ten years ago, it was more like every day, get up, grind it out, figure out the next move, let's do it. Blah, blah. Now I wake up, check out some emails, go, what the fuck am I going to do like, Hey, nothing going on. I'll go to the studio and make a beat. Like it's just more when I have time and I and, and my mind's in the mood, I go make music, not wake up make music anymore. Do you feel like that's turning out better product? Um just being more I do. I, I do because I just feel like my shit always gets better. But that's just my opinion being around it. You know, you have to ask the listeners, I guess, but yeah, I, I always feel like my shit's getting better on the production end, on the flow end, on the writing end, and just growing up in life and just not worrying about stupid ass shit and write dumb songs that don't matter. Trying to write something that say something and make a difference to people. Yeah, definitely the the kind of the meaning or the um, the message, I guess, has really been more highlighted. I guess in some of the more recent records. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. There's maturity there. Yeah. Yeah, I I really like this new EP. So can you tell me a little bit about the the time EP? I guess for those listening at home, it's available now. Um, you can check it out on Spotify and whatnot as well. Is it available also on physical format at all, like CD or, or vinyl or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just shipped out like seventy packages of vinyl this morning. So that's yeah, yeah. Good. We got vinyl, CD, and all that. But we just been selling it from our own site and from uh, just like directly. Honestly, I, I, I'm trying to make it more directly with people. Like, I, I just feel like nowadays people want to have that connection. I know I do, like, if I'm dealing with buying merch and stuff. So, you know, we're taking the orders directly, sign them up, got my kids and my wife shipping them out and just try to really do it grassroots. And it's, it's been cool. As long as it doesn't get too crazy and hectic, we'll probably keep doing it this way for a minute. Yeah, the, the pandemic's obviously kind of put a stop. And that's kind of what but... sparked it all. Is like, I can't tour right now. I can't do yeah. shows. And, you know, just sitting in the studio after finishing an album isn't as exciting to me right now i'd rather kind of just focus on something else so focusing on the store a little bit of video editing just different things because of the pandemic yeah and at least locally here like i'm in glace bay nova scotia right so i'm in, i'm on Cape Breton island and we don't really get a whole lot of people out here but but you're really known around these parts as being like a touring act and you come here all the time you always show love i think for the most part yeah i was up in uh right like a month ago yeah yeah we sold it to what is it the, the, the driving drive theater yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And then the old Savoy Theater, like I can go back, like Glace Bay, like that's how I'm going to go Glace Bay, is the Savoy Theater playing there many times. 
yeah, it's, but I guess to go back to it, I, I feel like you're really kind of established as a touring artist, uh, especially around the Maritimes. Um, I feel like the pandemic would have to be like extremely catastrophic to your like monetary life anyways. Oh yeah. Actually. Like just like, yeah, yeah. Like this summer, like festival wise, we lost, you know, six figures. And then I'm supposed to be on tour right now in an acoustic tour, like our original plan. Um, it's supposed to be October and November touring the rest of Canada. So that's another big amount of money that's just that's like, real. shit, we lost that year. But you know what I mean? Like, I save for rainy days, so it's not like I'm sitting over here starving by any means. It's just, you know, when I make a plan, I like to stick to it. When shit gets fucked up, it kind of gets frustrating. But you adjust. Everyone's adjusting in this world. There's people in a lot worse positions than me, so I, I'd never complain about it. Assuming this stuff kind of clears up in the next few months, maybe by the end of the year, um, are you planning on touring off of this new material for the new EP? Yeah, well, like right now, we can't do shit. Like, it's funny you say that. Like, I was talking to my booking agent yesterday, and I'm like, okay, well, the rest of Canada is going to shit. The Atlantic Atlantic provinces are, are killing it. Like, we have one case in Nova Scotia, I think, right? Now. Pretty good, yeah. Like, we're not going to get any better than we are right now. Let's be honest, in Nova Scotia. You know, people are going to come in, travel. Once in a while, a case will get in. The person, you know, like, one case in the whole province is pretty fucking amazing. So, to me, it's like, okay, well, let's see if we can do a tour of Atlanta, Canada. Um, but, like, right now, we have our acoustic tour booked for all Canada. that's supposed to be now. to changed till May of next year. So, even now, we're kind of getting close where it's like, I don't even know if that's going to happen now because just the way the rest of Canada is going. Yeah, even within Atlantic Canada, though, I think they have like limits gathered uh, or gathering limits set to like 50 or something still, right? Yeah, which, it's which still okay, small. But it's just, yeah, it's small. It, no, it's, it's, it's a different type of show and the money ain't the same because, you know, a venue that could hold 600 people can only hold 200 now or whatever it is. Yeah. But. I, I don't know. I, I think the Maritimes has got to change soon because, like I said, is it ever going to get better than what it is right now for us? Probably not. Probably not until there's a vaccine, right? Yeah. Even then, though, like there's a vaccine for flu. People still get the flu. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like one like... person in our province. Like I could see if there was 100, 50, 60, but one person. And not to mention that there's like, you know, in the last four months, we haven't had one case other than connected to travel so it's not like some town in shelburne or in glace bay has a hidden family out there that's got the cove and it's about to break out like it's not in our province at all except for you know these couple travel cases that come in and they seem to be shutting it down and, and staying on top of it well so hopefully it just keeps going the same way yeah hopefully it goes the same way and hopefully we're able to lift some of these kind of restrictions even further um especially as the other provinces start to kind of get their act together or if there's a vaccine, like well, that, and that's what I mean. Yeah. I don't think the other provinces are getting back together. Is the sad thing. Like I heard Toronto had their highest case yesterday, and like since like May or April or some shit. Yeah, you also run with like diminishing returns when it comes to people's safety, right? Like people don't after a certain period of time of being locked up in the house, even if they were following the rules five months ago, they don't want to do that shit anymore, right? Um, people are just getting tired and they want to end up going out and enjoying life, and I feel like that's especially like youth culture and whatnot i feel like they're really kind of getting sick of it um even people that were like being pretty responsible when this shit all started right hoping that it was only going to be hey if we lock down for 15 days we can eradicate the cases here then we can be fine uh, well yeah that's, that's how it started two, two weeks to flatten the curve it's like shit it's been eight months yeah but yeah. to me that kind of proves and some people might not like me saying this but that kind of proves the unselfishness of maritimers like the fact that we have no cases because we shut the fuck down. There was no big parties in Waterloo. Like, like you hear about these parties all over Ontario, Alberta, this and that. It's like, come on. Like, you know, I, I'm still 50 50. Obviously, COVID is something. It's a big deal. You don't hear about deaths that much anymore, which I find really weird. You still hear about all these cases and everything growing up, but you don't hear about the deaths as much. So I don't know if the you know the case the the rate that i don't know the proper way to word this is like the amount of people that are getting how much are actually dying from it yeah so i don't know man and it's also that point in life where i don't even know if i believe the news anymore like just there's so much shit put out in the world now on facebook that it's like it's hard to believe what's real what's not and 
you know, it's it, it's a weird time right now. I watched the social the social dilemma last night. You see that? I haven't seen it, but I see people talk about it. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It, it opens your mind in a different way of like, wow, this is kind of there's something going on here that's going to be a lot more serious. Just dividing people. Social media just divides people. Yeah, basically, it's, what it's, it's saying. It's and now it's crossing over to real life now where, you know, people are voicing their opinions, arguing, and they only have the information they have. So they feel like they're right and vice versa for the other side that it's like, man, the world is really becoming divided. Yeah, it's crazy that even the news networks nowadays are like a he said, she said type shit with the left wing like CNN or like Fox News. All of it, man. Like, like I just, I don't before, know what to believe anymore. Each other. Yeah. Even going down to the the massacre that happened here and then like what's going on with that and then you know the inquire into it the public one they wouldn't do it and then people kicked up the stink and now they're doing it and the guy took money from the air there's all this different information you hear and it's like i don't know what the fuck's real what's not but it makes it a lot more harder to just sit down watch the news and see yeah i think a, a large part of it too has to do with people's like um need or desire for having everything so quickly right like there's no time to vet out information there's no time to really sit with something and let a let a third party kind of go through it and say like what information do we have here what's accurate what's not so accurate and then let's put this out to the public Um, nowadays people want that information right away and not only that but they have the ability to get the information right away somebody who will and and they have the ability to throw up fake information right away exactly yeah um, so you get all these little perspectives and some of the perspectives aren't true. Some of them are, but, uh, that news kind of sources end up kind of latching on to that type of information, um, just cause they want a headline. They want a story to tell. Right uh, up. And like, I've yeah. gone through that with certain news places that they'll build a story out of something that, you know, even I do that's bullshit. Like we did that, that show, we did a, a show for one of the graduating classes in June. And, you know, one of the news stations made a big deal about it. Oh, 300 students classified, blah, blah, blah. This is horrible. It's like, first of all, there was only 160 kids. So you lied right at the gate, doubled the numbers. And just trying to make it this big thing. And Dr. Strange was disappointed. And it's just, oh, my fuck, you lied like three times in that news thing. And you're the news. Like, just makes it, it makes it hard to trust these people. And trust the news and the ones that you grew up thinking like yep this is what's real this is what they tell us 100 percent. so moving on i guess from the uh the pandemic from the the covid (laughs) um the the new ep so you have the new ep out um are you i assume you're still working on new music and there's new music coming in addition to this ep um i assume generally when an artist ends up releasing an ep or a mixtape or something of that fashion it's it's meant to tide us over until we get something a little bit larger what's What's currently no, your go? No, with this, it was I made eight songs and I was like, I'm not just dropping an EP because EPs or albums just come and go in two weeks now. So yeah. that's why I dropped four songs. I dropped half the EP before it even came out, like the Rap Shake, Good News, Pick Your Poison, and, and then the track with Mercury's. So that that's me just trying to get life out of music. Like I, I hate putting out music and then it's just, you know, you work on something for a year and a half, the album comes out, people are asking for a new album the week after going, Oh, this is dope. Can't wait for the next one. It's like, what the fuck? Like, I just remember I came up at a time when albums lasted for eight, nine months. You know, like that's how I got into my favorite albums. I was lasting for a year back in the day. So I really wanted to just kind of slow down, you know, make it a one song thing, put a one song, promote it for two months, let people live with it. And then, you know, putting the EPO was just kind of like to bring the whole project together. Um, but other than that, like for new music, that's it. Like I got nothing else on the, on the thing other than like I got this acoustic album coming out next year and that's what the tour would be for I got a book like just on my whole career and just meeting people and just talking about that and that's kind of like the next thing is this acoustic kind of greatest hits thing fair enough one of the things that uh, I noticed and you mentioned there is just putting out like half the album before the, the project was actually out itself in terms of singles but the music video tip you've really been on the grind at least this year in terms of just like cranking out these music videos um is that something that you're kind of more focused on? I, I see a lot of artists doing that. I see you working with Ari the Rugged Man as well. Um, yeah. But um, it was just, it, I feel like, and I guess Ari is a good example. It seems like a lot of artists nowadays are really prioritizing that music video and making almost a video for every song off of an album. Uh, yeah, and that's what I did. Like, the more it could be, the day things changed. That was 13 songs. Every single song had a video. Yeah. 
Uh, this new one, every song has a eh, I shouldn't say every song we released so far had a video. Trust is or uh, I love it just came out, so that'd be the fifth video. So we got three songs without videos that you know we're kind of planning to shoot a couple things now. But it's also because we shoot our own videos now, so it doesn't cost us twenty five grand to shoot a video. Every time. <laughs> Um, so like, you know, me and my brother shoot our videos now. So to me, that's like another exciting part of it. When I'm writing a song or when I'm working on it, I'll start seeing what I want for the video and I'll go to my brother and say, Hey, I want to do this for the video. And we'll sit together, plan it out and end up shooting it together. He'll take it back, edit it. And you know, it costs us nothing now. We bought our own camera and my brother's on salary for half life. So, you know, he does shows with me, but does video work as well. So really it doesn't cost anything to make a video anymore. So. For me, it's just another thing to bring somebody into that zone. Yeah, that's amazing because I feel like a lot of people, at least back in the day, would end up approaching music videos as kind of an investment, right? Like you're you're hoping for a return on that investment in order to promote your material. Um, but I feel like nowadays people are approaching it, and it's always it's always kind of been this way. But I feel like more so on an individual kind of independent artist to um, approaching it as art, right? And rather than an artist just creating music, they're also, as you said, you're you're the one they're doing videos in most cases and you have your own little in-house team that are doing it and putting it together um like that's that's an artistic endeavor in of itself right it's kind of an extension of the music it's not sure. necessarily just to promote that music and kind of invest in it no no like that shit's fun to me like to me yeah. I, I enjoy doing that sitting down coming up with an idea for it the shooting can usually be a stressful thing, but like coming back and seeing the footage and laying it over the song, it's like, oh shit, you just get like a whole different feel and a whole different excitement. And the old days too, you know, before commercial radio, Virgin would play any hip hop or some shit. The only way to ever get your music out was much music. Like I built my career off it. 